My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise. Take all the honor in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. I want to quickly appreciate the leadership of the church for this privilege to have me here tonight. I'm trusting the Lord that it will be a great blessing to you even in the course of this meeting. I know you've been richly blessed already given the array of ministers that have come. My brother was here last night and I knew it was a great blessing. I'll just add a few blocks to what they've been building already. And we trust the Lord that your life will be transformed. Trust the Lord that your life will be transformed. I want to thank the leadership of the youth for this great privilege. I do not take it for granted. Especially thank our daddy in the house for lending us his platform to communicate the counsel of God. Tonight we'll be doing a very brief walk and then we'll cap it off tomorrow by the message of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you give me sound at the background? I will soon take a flight and I trust God that many will be carried. Many will be carried along. Precious Lord Jesus. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, cry out, Kadosh. You see, there are many things contending for your attention. There are many things striving to seclude you and bring you into a civilization that will enslave you to a government. A government that your soul has no authority over because it is submitted to it on account of your desire to submit to that which is taking your attention. It is called the business of spirits. Spirits are into soul businesses, soul transactions. The goal of spirits are not many. Spirits have one singular ambition. The ambition of spirits is to create a civilization, a government in this visible creation where men are submitted to them to do their biddings and their counsel so that that which men do for them will become the meaning of their lives 
and the gateway through which spirits get access to you are through the, bound, the boundaries of your appetites. Without an appetite, it would be impossible for a spirit to access a human. You see, when God created man, He created him with a vacuum. That vacuum had um, a monitoring system, which is a hunger and a desire for the presence. But there was a distortion. The distortion that took place denatured the man God created. And on account of this denaturation of man, he sustained another kind of appetite different from the natural hunger that he had for God and his presence. And because of this new set of appetites that were created in man, it became possible for spirits to alight upon the souls of men in order to carry out businesses with these men. And man, unfortunately, could no longer operate at the height that he was designed to operate in. Because his energy is now depleted. He is now submitted to a government other than the government of God. Before the denaturation took place, man had only hunger for God. And the Bible tells us that Early in the morning, in the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden. And that was the height of man's satisfaction. The height of his satisfaction was that point where he had intercourse with the Spirit of God. That point where he came into koinonia with the Spirit of God. That was the beauty and the essence of his life. To find the presence of God every morning, alighting upon his soul and bringing him into intimacy with God. But when the denaturation took place, something happened. He sustained other sets of appetites. He developed lust. Lust and desires for things apart from God. Little did he know that these appetites he developed were actually the natures of different spirits that he gave allowance to on account of his obedience to their voice. What he thought was just an ordinary desire was beyond the desire. What he called a desire was actually a portal. A portal connected from his soul to another dimension. A dimension where spirits apart from the spirit of God could alight upon him. The Bible gave us few instances. If you read the scriptures, you will see that these appetites connected man to different kinds of spirits. One is called the spirit of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12, the Bible said, We have not received the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit of God to know the things that are freely given to us. And the spirit of the world connects to man through different sets of appetites. It was John that now gave us insight into the appetites that form the mast upon which the spirit of the world alights upon. John said, love not the world. He said, for they that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. He said, what is the love of the world? He said, it is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These sudden desires that were bettered in the man were actually masks that the spirit of the world would alight upon. So immediately these appetites were created. This man suddenly became a slave to the spirit of the world. There are other sets of appetites. Other appetites created in this man were desire for deception, desire for wickedness. And that set of appetite were also masked that the devil alights upon. Jesus said, He said, You are of your father, the devil. 
He said, because the devil, he said, his wicked works will you do. And he said, he was a liar from the beginning. So, characteristic of the devil are lying, deception, and wickedness. Suddenly, this man that according to the framework of his design was expected to sustain only the image and the likeness of God has begun to sustain other tendencies that were not captured within the nature of God. The nature of God is the nature of righteousness and the nature of love. According to the design of man, he was desired by God, fabricated by God, only to sustain the nature of God because he was made in the image and the likeness of God. And because he had only the nature of God, even though there were other spirits in the world, they could not interact with man. Neither could they participate in the protocol of creation. Because according to the government that God willed to man, man was the only one that had authority and dominion over the earth realm. So even though there was a lying spirit, there was no gate through which he could access the man. Because those appetites had not been formed. You know, without the mast, without the MTN mast, the MTN network cannot function. The mast is what inter interacts with the network. It is the mast that traps the network. And until the network is trapped, there can be no communication. So when man was not denatured, he did not sustain the ability to interact with other spirits apart from God. The moment he allowed himself to come under their government, something happened. He became a mask that transmitted the frequency of darkness in a world that was supposed to be governed by the forces of light. He did not know the implication of what had happened. Wickedness had creeped into the soul of man. Lying had creeped into the soul of man. Different kinds of lust had creeped into the soul of man. God decided to enact a new protocol. A new protocol that will alter the denatured man to come back and conform to the original design that he planned before the foundations of the world. Which was for man to be made in his own image and his likeness. That protocol was consummated in Christ. And now that this design has been consummated in Christ, your ability to travel in it and be reestablished back and conform to the image of Christ is what it means to be grounded. Because if you have not been able to conform to the new protocol that Jesus himself has set up, until you become like Jesus, then there is nothing like groundedness. You know, in our world today, we have reduced everything to cerebrality. We think groundedness is your ability to interpret scriptures correctly. So groundedness in a new context now has to do with doctrinal exegesis. So because the man knows what to say to match up the doctrine, he has become a grounded person. Whereas we do not understand that there is no groundedness except we reconnect back to the Spirit of God. Because it is in our reconnection with the Spirit of God that we will sustain the new nature of God. And on account of that nature, we now develop the capacity to influence our world. We have now reduced groundedness to a mental activity. So people come to church. All they do is in their soul, in their minds. That's why you discover that when the sound is on, you are lively. Because the sound interacts with your emotions. And your emotions are a component of your soul. That's why when you come to church, you discover that sometimes you carry out so many activities. But the ones that impact directly on your spirit, you don't have the capacity to do it. Because the kind of training that you were exposed to are trainings that only amplifies the capacities of your mind. So spirituality in our world today is cerebrality. We have been disconnected completely from life. We have been disconnected completely from the spirit realm because we think our ability to quote scriptures, to explain scriptures, is tantamount to spirituality. And that is why every time we are confronted by the real life situation, we are helpless. Because what we do not know is that until we reconnect back to spirit, until we reconnect back to life, there is nothing that is called groundedness at all. Groundedness has nothing to do with your emotional frequency. It has nothing to do with your intellectual capacities. That's why the theologian does not know God, even though he knows every scripture and he knows every doctrine. It is deeper than what he thinks it is. So people have no ability to pray, but they know all the scriptures that talk about prayers. 
people have no ability to sustain a life of righteousness but they go about they can even preach it people has no ability to demonstrate the characters of god but they preach it every day because they talk the doctrine from their head it is not coming from their spirit i want to show you tonight in Jesus' perspective what it means to be grounded in Jesus' perspective what it means to live because life in itself is not what you think it is before you understand what life really is you must have to journey back to the author of life to tell you what life is from his own plane of reference there are many choices many churches there are many ministers of the gospel but the world is going darker and darker because we have disconnected from life we don't understand that what we are doing is actually spirit business we are only called to be participators what is actually going on has nothing to do with you the people that are actually playing the game are spirits you are only called in this realm to give expression to the things that are happening in their realm you don't have a life life is actually giving expression to spirit realities because whether you like it or not you will conform to a spirit you will conform to a government whether you like it or not you will align with the spirit whether you do it consciously or not you have been designed to be a potter through which the spirit realm can invade the natural but because you are not taught you walk on in your ignorance you think it's about what you have in your mind and what you have in your mind have puffed you up so much that you think by talking what you know you can impact the earth realm it's a lie that's not how the wise men of old saw it and that is why their results are different from our own and that is why their lives are more meaningful than ours at the age of 17 david was a national figure he challenged goliath and defeated the enemy of israel at the age of 17 he has nothing to do with age because you think it's cerebrality that is why you think you must have to develop your brain to a level because before you are competent when it comes into spirit context even a child of 10 years can be a master because spiritual technologies are far from the mind the mind is only included to give expression to the things that are spirits i want to show you what jesus thinks life is and where you begin to live from because if you don't know it, you may be in church for 20 years and you will think you are an elder because you have been in church for long. We don't calculate life by time. We calculate life by reality. And only men that join into the realm of the Spirit can trap reality. Many people in church, but everybody is weak. Many Christians in the market, but the market is a picture of hell. The market is an expression of governments that are orchestrated from Hades. Many people who call themselves Christians in government, but you cannot see an ember of light in governmental powers, governmental authorities. There is no light there. Because all we have is in our head. You don't carry a spirit in your head. You carry him in your heart. Spirits don't dwell in your brain. They can only dwell in your heart. Only your heart is large enough to accommodate the spirit. You don't know why you are in church for 20 minutes and you are tired. You don't know why you can go to every other place apart from the prayer meeting. You don't know why they can persuade you only to come to church, but every other place you persuade yourself. You don't understand what is happening. You are actually a puppet in the hand of the Spirit. And until you have accurate understanding, you will not wake up to reality. I want to show you some basic truths in scriptures today. So that you will know how you begin to live. By the time you know it, nobody will tell you to come to church anymore. By the time you know it, the prayer meeting will become the most populated meeting. Because that is where our reference is gotten from. If you do not connect to a spirit, you are like a balloon floating on the earth. What keeps you on earth is the force of gravity. If you become disconnected from the spirit that powers creation, you are like a balloon floating. You cannot touch, you don't have a reference. Anywhere you float to, that is your new reality. Until you understand how these things work, then you will come back and plant yourself upon the mountains of Zion. Because only in Zion is the spirit of just men made perfect. But some of us are not taught. We are not taught. So we come to church as another preoccupation. It's far. It's far. It's far. Let me read two scriptures before I begin to jump. John chapter 3 verse 1. It may help me explain what I'm trying to say. It will help me explain it. 
There are many young people today that are lost. They are lost. Many of us in church are lost. The kind of thoughts that go on in our mind, we can't control it. The kind of things we do, we can't control them. We have hidden, we have knelt down, we have cried. But we cannot understand why. We get more committed to activities, but we are still in bondage. We cannot understand why. It is simple. We are disconnected from the Spirit. We know a lot about the Spirit, but we don't know the Spirit. You see, when you, when you study mathematics, when you study chemistry, when you study geography, you can read it and know about it, and it's enough. But it doesn't work like that with Spirit. In spiritual context, knowledge has different depths. There is a knowledge that you know about, and there is a knowledge you know to become. In the context of spiritual realities, knowledge is not something you know about. Knowledge is something you apprehend. You become one with it. The word is called epignosis. But until you can travel into the spirit, you will never apprehend it. Many people are lost. Many have no reference. You see, even the so-called spiritual ones, every time they want to make a decision in life, that is where you see how confused they are. The ones that are spiritual, that think they are spiritual. You know, they think they are spiritual because they have their emotions. They have understood how to stir their emotions. So there is a kind of song they sing that stir their emotion. When those songs begin to sing, they start crying. Some of them are even slain. They fall down, they are overwhelmed. And because they roll on the floor, they think they are spiritual. But when they want to make a decision about life, when they need the voice of God to tell them, take right, not left. That is when you discover that they are far from the spirit realm. Because they don't have understanding on how to connect to that dimension. There are a lot of things we do that are wrong. We are not taught. We are not taught correctly. And some of us have not received the ability to do. Let me show you something. John chapter 3 verse 1. The Bible said there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Do you hear his credentials? He was what? A man. He was what? A Pharisee. His name was what? Nicodemus. He was what? A ruler. Do you see his credentials? You see, in our world today, such a man is a man that you will call highly spiritual. Why? Because of his credentials. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. You see that he knows about Jesus. We know that thou art what? A teacher come from God. For no man can do the, thing, the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He also knows how God operates. He knows about Jesus to be a teacher come from God and he also knows how God operates. God only works with people that he is with. So as far as doctrinal understanding was concerned, he was very accurate. We know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. But when Jesus answered him, Jesus left his realm. The realm Jesus talks from is not the realm where men talk from. Everything that they called valuable could not impress an immortal. Because the value systems of the immortals are different. You see, it is possible for me to appear on a white suit today. And then it looks as if I'm a holy man. But when you begin to judge from the scales of the immortals, the last thing they will see is my dress. The first thing the immortals will see is the texture of my heart. That is what impresses them. This one cannot pass through the veil of the divide. When Jesus began to address Nicodemus, he forgot about the fact that he was a Pharisee. He forgot about the fact that he was a ruler. He forgot about the fact that he was a teacher. You know, in the days of old, the Pharisees were like the highest college of learning as far as spiritual things were concerned. When he said, we know, he was not talking as an individual. He was making a statement that the whole sect 
have deliberated on and the conclusions that they arrived at. And this sect is called the Sanhedrin. These were the most learned of men in the days of their time, as far as spiritual realities were concerned. Among the Sanhedrins are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and some of the scribes. And even in the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees were seen to be more learned. They were called doctors of the law. In fact, they had so much authority in their day that if you begin a ministry, they will send to you and say, by whose authority are you doing what you are doing? Because they are the ones that accredit people to do ministry. Just the way you, no university will be recognized today unless NUC gives it accreditation. In the days of old, if the Pharisees do not accredit your ministry, you are making noise, they can shut you down. That was why when John began in the wilderness, they sent to him, by whose authority are you doing what you are doing? Tell us so that we will go back and tell them. Anything they say became the counsel of God. They were seen as wise men. They were seen as people that nobody could match whenever you began to talk about spiritual things. But when this man came to Jesus, the first thing Jesus began to address was his foundation. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, this kingdom that you are trying to talk about, you can't even see it. Because where you are standing is defective. You must stand on a spiritual ground before you can even understand the things you want to talk about. The things you want to talk about, they are bigger than your mind. Your mind cannot comprehend it. You must have to be born of a spirit before you can begin to talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not for the learned. The kingdom of God is for the spiritual. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The word see is the word perceive. He cannot understand the kingdom of God. So forget the fact that you are a Pharisee. Forget the fact that you are a part of the Sahendri. Forget the fact that you are a ruler. You cannot know the kingdom unless you are born of the spirit. So in verse 6 he says, that which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. All your revelation came from the flesh. You cannot engage me because I am not in the flesh. The things you are attempting to do, the energy level is not in the flesh. You see, some of you attempt to carry out spiritual transactions with the energy of the flesh. It will not pass the taste of the mortars. That's why as you do it, when your energy is exhausted, you become tired. But the truth is that if you connect and plug into the energy of the spirit, the more you do it, the stronger you become. Because the part of the just is as a shiny light, shining brighter and brighter. So any activity you begin to engage that is born of the Spirit, the more you do it, the stronger you become, not weaker. So the foundation is wrong. You can't talk about these matters. Some of us come when we, everything we begin to do, you just see flesh. And then we keep doing it, appraising ourselves, recording ourselves as perfect, but it is born in the flesh. It cannot pass the taste of the waters. Let me show you something. Psalm 82 verse 6. I'm trying to stay calm because I'm seeing a lot of young people. I don't want to I don't want to lose them. Psalm 82, verse 5. He said, They know not, neither do they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of their course. Now, what the scripture is trying to show is this. The moment you are not built on the spirit, the moment what you are doing is not established on the premise of a spirit, he said, first, there is a knowledge gap. Everything you think is wrong. No matter how right you say it, it is wrong because what? It is not established on the reality of a spirit. Secondly, he said, you cannot even understand what you are talking about. That's why most of us are talking prayer, but we are not making progress by prayer. Because we don't understand what prayer is. That's why most of us are talking church. 
but we are not making progress by church. That's why most of us are calling ourselves Christians, but nothing about us resembles the life of God. Because you cannot understand. And then thirdly, he said they walk in darkness. Every step you take will be wrong. You want to get married, you check, 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 you calculate, you calculate. After you have checked all the modalities and you have made your decision, your decision is wrong. And you may not know it now. It's after 10 years you will discover. Why? They walk on in darkness. Because the manual has been removed. The spirit is not the basis for the operation. You check your life for a moment. What was the last thing you did by an express instruction of the Holy Ghost? Just take a scan for a moment. Then you discover where you are. What was the last thing you did that was inspired by the Holy Spirit? Including the job you are doing now. Including where you are now. Including the words that proceed from your mouth. When was the last time you took a decision or you carried out an action that was inspired by the Holy Ghost? But all of us are rematokas. All of us are lofty people with lofty minds. But we cannot remember the last decision we took. And we took because God says to do it. Why? You walk on in darkness. Most of us, our life is a function of trial and error. What is keeping us is the residual grace that God put in creation. If not for the mercies of God that is factored into creation, by now would have would have been crushed. Nothing we do that is based on an express instruction of God, even those of us in ministry, those of us who are in campus ministry, who are leaders, we do things by strategy. He said there is a knowledge gap. Knowledge in this context is experience. It's experience. The experience of God is limited. It's no longer there. So we can't discern the mind of God. But the apostles, when they took decision, they took it by the Holy Ghost. In the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 28, they said, He pleased the Holy Ghost and us that we should not laden you with more bodies. There was an experience of God. So they could pick the mind of God. They could discern the movements of God. So they took their decisions based on what God is taking and what God is thinking at that time. They were always in sync with the present revelation position of the Spirit of God. They knew what God is thinking part time. They understood the emotions of God. He said, He pleased the Holy Spirit and us. It pleased the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you took the, a decision because it pleased the Holy Spirit? You can't even know it because there's a knowledge gap. What you do is not born of the Spirit. It's born of the flesh. And Jesus said, no matter how you paint it, it's flesh. Be it prayer. Your prayer is born of the flesh. Jesus said, it is flesh. Your tongues, tongue talking. It's born of the flesh. Jesus says it's flesh. No matter how loud you say it, they can give you all the effects on the keyboard and it becomes very loud. Jesus says it is flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. The mortars only judge things based on the spirit that powers them. We have a challenge in the body of Christ. Many congregations many crowds but full of flesh if you read that scripture in context you will think Jesus' emphasis was only about being born again but when you go a bit further then you discover that it did not stop with the born again experience it has to do with everything you do in your life including where you go every day including every word you utter because in verse 8, Jesus said, As the wind blow it, as the wind blow it, that thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth, he says, So are they that are born of the Spirit. 
The moment you are born of the Spirit, according to Jesus' scale, every other thing you begin to do from then forward is inspired by the Holy Ghost. If it is true that you are born of the Spirit, the knowledge gap will be removed. The difficulty in understanding will be worked on. You will now become one with the Holy Spirit, just the way the wind is one. Groundedness is to be infused with the life of God. Groundedness is to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you study the book of Matthew chapter 16, from verse 14, Jesus said, Who do men say I am? And then the apostles came, and then they submitted all the theology of their time. He says, Some say, they were referring to the sects. Some say, You are John the Baptist. That was the theology of that generation. Some say you are Elias. Some say you are Jeremiah. Others say you are one of the prophets. So the whole theology of that generation got it wrong. It is possible for a whole generation to be wrong about a context. It is possible for a whole generation to be wrong about a truth. It is possible for a whole generation not to be accurate, regardless of who is saying it. Because if it is not born of the Spirit, it can never pass the taste of the immortals. The Pharisees probably say you were John. The Sadducees probably said you were Elias. The scribes probably said you were Jeremiah. Others said you are one of the prophets. All of them were wrong. That is why they could never grow. That, could, that is why they could never be built in God. When they saw the Jesus they were looking for in the scriptures, they could not recognize him. Because their knowledge was a function of mental rigor. Is it not what we do today? We go to preach and we carry concordances, we search on Google and then we formulate our messages there and we go to preach. We are talking one thing on our lips and our heart is different. You are a leader in a fellowship, you are telling others to pray but you never pray. Why? It is born of the flesh. But Jesus asked fishermen who were never schooled, and one of them spoke by the Spirit. And the only statement he made, a one sentence statement that he made, was correct. And it defied the statements that were made by all the bodies of truth in the whole generation. That is what it means to be born of the Spirit. If what you do is not born of the Spirit, it will perish with you. And even if you cross to the other side of eternity, not one of it will go with you. That is why it is stringent. These matters are stringent. These matters are important. But a lot of us don't understand. I began by telling you that everything we are doing here, everything we are doing is an activity of spirits. The clothes all of us are wearing here is an activity of spirits. What all of us are thinking right now is an activity of spirits. Men do not have the capacity to create. Men do not have the capacity to originate anything. The thoughts in our heads now are activities of spirits. The clothes all of us decided to wear to this place are activities of spirits. Life is more spiritual than it's natural. The natural dimension is only a picture of the spiritual dimension. The seen dimension is only a revelation of the unseen dimension. You can't create anything. You can't burn or give birth to anything. Science has improved for more than 2 million years, but they have not been able to create a blade of grass. As simple and casual as it is, as advanced as technology is, they can't create a blade of grass. We are not designed to be creative. 
we were designed to be yielded. That is where our life begins to find meaning. It's possible for you to come into time and think it's all about business and money. And then you make money all your life. It's possible for us to come to time and think it's all about fashion. And then you make fashion all your life. And you never connect it to the spirit realm until you depart. It's a game of spirits. You and I, we are in a league of spirits. They are using us the way we use chess boards. We are in a game of spirits. Whether you know it or not, we are participants of the purposes of spirits. So you must learn and make up your mind to know how you must begin to live from the spirit realm. If you don't get there, everything you know and your experience is a waste. All the meetings you go and fall on the ground is a waste. Because your life begins to count the day the Holy Ghost is giving opportunity to live through you. That has been his ambition all the while. The Holy Ghost has no other ambition. He wants to live. He wants to manifest Jesus. And the only chamber he has to manifest Jesus is you and I. The day Jesus begins to live through you by the Holy Spirit, that's the day your life begins to count. You can live for 50 years, your life will not count. Because as far as the divine side is concerned, you were only giving expression to different spirits apart from God. Some of us, our walls are a reflection of different spirits. Our dress code is a reflection of different spirits. Our energies and our abilities is a reflection of different spirits. So you can gossip for four hours. You can quarrel for three hours. But you cannot pray for three hours. The energy that emits through your vessel is a reflection of a spirit. The day Jesus begins to live through you, that's the day you are relevant. And life is short. What you call time is not up to a dot in eternity. You are only living on this side. That is why you think it's large. In the immortal side, it's like a dot. Because it is not controlled by time. It's not governed by time. When you go into immortality, 100 years will be a moment. It will be a moment. That was why Moses could climb a mountain and was there for 40 days. And he saw everything that happened from when the world was created up to where he was standing. How can he see that? Only Adam lived for 930 years. Methuselah lived for 969 years. How was Moses able to see everything that had happened through many generations only in 40 days? The realm he was looking into is not governed by time. Why then will you think your own value should only be calculated in terms of time? What a waste. You go to a realm where time is not relevant. And then all you have, all your resources, all your value can be calculated in terms of time. You have been wasted. The only thing that can strike a mark in eternity are the things that are born by those spirits. So when you institute their reality here in time, by the time you journey back to their realm, you become a pillar. You are called a memorial for eternity. Because the reason why that spirit found expression in time is because you gave him access. So when you go back into his world, you will share in his glory. If all you gave access to is the devil, by the time you journey back to eternity, you will share with him. Because spirits are into leagues with men. Why would you not begin to give value to your life? Some of us spend all our value time on the things that appeal to our appetites. Either because of the house we want to build, the savings we have, we expand all our energies pursuing those ambitions. What a waste. What a waste. Has time itself not taught you enough lesson? The people that pursue those things, where are they? The houses that were the best houses 50 years ago, today they are trash. 
You have not gone to eternity yet. The only difference is that you came 50 years after the man that labored to build that house. If only that man had the understanding you have now, he would not have wasted his time on that house. Because you came after him. By reason of the time you came into this world, you are wiser than him. Because you saw everything he lived for is a waste. Already in time, you have not gone to eternity yet. And then you have not been educated enough. You are living the same way. So that the people that will come 50 years after you, we also know that your life was a waste. Time is a journey of value. You are giving value systems from eternity to sustain and to transact with them in time. Maybe I should just tell you a little about spirit civilization. I didn't want to talk about mysteries. But maybe let me just tell you about a little about spirit civilizations. Maybe to open your eyes before we begin to pray. Tonight I've not come to do so much of doctrine. I've just come to charge up your spirits. I've come to stir up your, your pure hearts. So that you begin to see better. Because if you see with only what you are seeing today. If you see with the vistas you are seeing today. You may end up a waste in eternity. That's why a large church like this can be empty. Where there are many vibrant youths. You expand your energy on other things. The day your life begins to count. People will find out where you are coming from. They will follow you. It's not to come and tell people, go and do evangelism. All you need to do is to burn. Somebody asked John Wesley, how are you able to gather the crowds? He said, I set myself on fire. And the world comes to watch me burn. The world comes to watch me burn. They called Jesus the prince of devils. It didn't matter. The crowd pursued him. Because he was on fire. He was burning. He was a mystery to everything the theologians knew. You can talk against him, but you can't deny his results. So he went into the wilderness. 5,000 men pursued him there. You come to church every day alone. That's because nobody knows the God you are serving. You don't look like him. The day you begin to look like the God you are serving, everybody will follow him. It will shock you to know that Jesus never called us believers. Jesus never called us saints. Jesus never called us Christians. He called us witnesses. The word witness means exhibit. You are the proof that Jesus is real. And if your life cannot validate the existence of Jesus, then you are a waste. Because in eternity, your name is supposed to be an exhibit. When you came into time, who did you prove to that Jesus is God? The Muslim guy believed there is a God, but he doesn't believe Jesus is God. The only thing that will make him believe Jesus is God is because the exhibit is still in this world. But if you have not touched the spirit, all you have is in your head. So the guy who studies more than you, will, con will, he will confound you. But the day you enter the spirit, what you bet is spirit life. Most of us are not living. We are just breathing oxygen. The day Jesus lives through you, that is the day your life begins to count. If you forget everything, don't forget that. The day Jesus begins to live through you, that is the day your life begins to count. It's not a function of age. It's a function of obedience. Yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. Yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. There are places where they don't have chairs. People come to stand. You have a large auditorium. Nobody is sitting inside. You are a waste. You are not a profitable youth. You may feel bad, but that's the truth. Because you are the one Jesus depends on. Have you not heard that the Bible said... Who will tell him to descend back? He can't come back. You are here for him. And if Jesus was here, it doesn't matter what people think or what people say. The crowd will be here. And beyond the crowd, their lives will be transformed. What are we using our energies for? What are we using our energies for? A revival is coming. And that is what will determine those who will be relevant in the next generation. But how many of us will be caught up in that web? How many will be caught up in that web? We want to hear sweet things. We want to hear lofty things. We want to hear inspiring things. 
you have been inspired for many years, what has he resorted to? At this level, they still beg some people to come to church. You still have to send text message for them to come to church. In heaven, it doesn't matter who was leading you. What matters is, what did you do with the Holy Ghost that was put in you? God invested in every one of us the Holy Ghost. So we would not have any excuse. That's why he said, you don't need any man to teach you. He said, that anointing that is in you, teaches you all things. You don't need anybody to inspire you. You don't need anybody to set you on fire. The Holy Ghost is doing more than enough. You are refusing to yield. That's why you are where you are. And like I told you, these are matters of spirit civilization. You don't know the game spirits are playing over your life. That's why you think it's a joke. Adam thought it was all about fruits. He didn't know that his destiny was being backed. When the spirit comes to you, it shows you a good part. But the end is destruction. There is a good that has destruction at the end. That good is of the devil. The devil is not all bad. There is a good in the devil, but the end of his good leads to death. That is why he shows you that path to deceive you, to beguile you. It's called the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Good has never been trained with evil, but there is a good in devil that leads to evil. It leads to death. It leads to destruction. That's why he shows you that path, and then you enjoy it. You think it's good, but at the end of the day, he is bargaining your destiny. Being set on fire is not to be, is not to hear things that inspire you and you are jumping. Being set on fire is not to hear sounds that make you feel excited. Being set on fire is for spirits to be literally transferred into you. A higher intensity of spirits. When it's imparted into you, his character dominates you. That's why you see a madman behaving the way he's doing. He is over, overdosed by a spirit of madness. So he cannot but manifest madness. When you see a girl dressing lustfully and carrying out sexual activity, it's not that he's been on fire. She was overdosed by a spirit of immorality. She can't control it. Everywhere she goes, she manifests it. The same way, if an intensity of the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you become a mobile Holy Spirit. You come to a place people are burning. As you are talking, he's rising on your inside. As you are praying, he's rising on your inside. You don't come to shout in the place of prayer. You come to be stirred so that you can go to higher corridors, higher chambers in eternity, where you will utter words from and you will be seen as a judge. Being on fire is not what you think it is. This thing is spirit business. You follow him until he saturates you. When he saturates you, his character is seen over you. His abilities are seen over you. His wisdom is seen all over you. That is when you are grounded. It's not when you want to read books. And then you come to talk it to spike people. It's folly. It's folly. You don't know this city where you are was built on blood and enchantment. That's why you think you can come here and then you will be what you want to be. No. Your thoughts have been already conditioned before you were born. There is no city that is built without the intelligence of spirits. Spirits are responsible for building cities. If you study the scripture, you will find it. Egypt was built by the by Leviathan that was lying in the Red Sea. He built Egypt. If you are in Egypt, you must submit to the government of Leviathan. When God delivered Israel, He didn't just deliver them. He was the one that had in the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a subject of Leviathan. When God finally wanted to let them go, He didn't go to Pharaoh. He went to judge the gods of Egypt. Exodus chapter 12 verse 12. He said, tonight I will pass through Egypt, slay all their first sons, and I will judge the gods of Egypt. When the gods of Egypt were judged, Pharaoh's hand opened. Spirit, cities are built by spirits. They have, their, they have their wise men 
that controls and regulates the minds of those who are supposedly rulers. And they bring them counsels that are conformed to the desires of those spirits. If you study Babylon, the mighty city of Babylon was built by sorcery and astrology. It has nothing to do with the strength of the Bukadnezah. They are wise men. They fabricate the texture of a city. So when you come into that city, the only way you can stay righteous is until you are aligned to a government. So the reason Daniel was different is because he connected and clung to his own God. The Bible said they could not find any occasion against Daniel except as he borders on his relationship with his God. In Daniel chapter 6 verse 5. That was why Daniel was righteous in Babylon. Because Babylon was built on astrology. It was built on sorcery. And if you are in Babylon and you don't have another God, you must be a subject of that astrology. You think you are in Enugu and you do what you want. <laughs> you are not wise. Wise men have designed the foundation of this land. When you come, you will discover after many years that you are like somebody that has passed before. It's a genealogy. A spiritual genealogy has been put in place. You will find things peculiar to everybody here. They will do it. The campuses you go to were built by intelligence of witchcraft. So you will enter a virgin, you will come out a lesbian. It is stronger than the powers of your will. It's a technology of spirits. So when you are raising people and it's all about counsel, inspiration, and doctrine, it's a waste. People must be caused to go deep until they touch the waters of the spirit. That is when they are, they are established in God. You have not touched those foundations. It's a waste. Did you not watch Melly? You think Great Britain was built because they had intelligent scientists. They were built by spirits. The kings are there winning wars. Think they are winning wars. They are functions of sorcery. In the demonic... Oh my God. I, I can't talk to you about, about the demonic. If I tell you about the demonic, you know why you are doing what you are doing. The things you think you are doing in the hiding. You just realize that you are playing a script. A script that was written in the spirit realm. You have been programmed. <laughs> if God begins to open your eyes, you will understand why you must yield to the Holy Spirit. The things you will do wrong from now to the end of December, they are already written down. And demons have been mobilized to manipulate your mind to do it. Those scripts keep unfolding. They keep unfolding. They keep unfolding. Demons are on duty on your head. <laughs> if God opens your eyes, you will, be, you will marvel. You, you think you like the girl. You are not wise. Whispering spirit are choking your mind with thoughts and you think you are thinking. Spirits, they are wiser than you. You can't understand their ways. You only discover the one that is good and you submit to him. And his name is the Holy Ghost. You see, Paul, Paul was a man of doctrine. Teaching people the ways of God. A point came, he discovered that if he does not introduce the syllables of warfare, the people are lost. <laughs> when Paul was introduced to the demonic texture, the demonic ranking, that was when his ministry changed. Suddenly, Paul, that will tell you, you are complete in Christ. Paul, that will tell you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Paul, that will tell you, there is now no condemnation. Paul, that will tell you, that you are a God. Paul now begins to tell you, brother, casting down imagination. And every high standing thing that opposes itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity all things to the obedience of Christ. He said, when your obedience is complete, then you can avenge other disobedience. At first you will think, with the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. No. 
Every knee only bow when your own obedience is complete. Those were the things Paul began to discover when he began to journey into the Spirit. As he began to journey into the Spirit, he now began to discover a lot of things. That there are governments doing this thing. And if you don't submit to one government, you don't have authority to challenge another government. So he said, when your own obedience is complete, that is when you can avenge other obedience. And then he journeyed from there again. He now began to tell you that you can cast out demons, but there are some other beings in the demonic that you cannot cast out. Those ones are not demons. He said they are fallen angels. He said you war with them. Those ones will fight you. You don't cast them out. You fight with them. Because they will war with you. Perhaps when you collide with a demon, you cast it out. And the reason a demon will possess somebody is because the demon has no body. So it's needing body in order to express itself. He said, but there are others called fallen angels. They are in different ranks. Some of them are principalities. Some are powers. Some are rulers of darkness. He said, some are spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. He said, those ones, you must war with them. And he said, first, for you to war with them, there are things you must have to do. One, you must be strong in the Lord. You must be strong in the Lord. You know what it means to be strong in the Lord? You must be established in God, in truth and in verity. You must submit sufficiently to the government of Jesus to a point where you have no life anymore. Jesus is the one living through you. At that point, when you come out, it's Jesus that moves. He said, then you are strong in the Lord. He said, then you must be strong in the power of His might. The word power there is the word kratos. The word might is the word iskus. Kratos is dynamic power. The power that you receive in the Holy Ghost is called dunamis. That is potential. Kratos is you must have traded with dunamis until that thing is converted to dynamic power. This light you are seeing is kratos. What is in the generator is dunamis. You must work with dunamis until it becomes on to generate this light. He said when you are able to activate dunamis and it's converted to kratos, then you must also learn how to interact in the spirit realm until you can sense angels and partner with them in warfare. Because the word iskus means collaborative power. It means governmental power. It means co cooperative and synergistic power. You must become alive in the spirit to a level where you can discern the movement of angelic beings. That was what Daniel had. Before Daniel confronted with the prince of Persia, he understood how to speak with Gabriel and, and, and Michael. Because you don't fight principalities. Angels fight angels. What you do is that you partner on earth and give them support through prayers. So Paul is telling us, it's not enough to be a believer. It's not enough to be born again. You must trade with the things of God until you become, it becomes real to you. The power of God you receive in the Holy Ghost. You can't just keep saying, I have power, I have power. You must interact with it in tongues, in fasting, and in prayers until that power becomes palpable. You can transmit it. You must be strong in the place of prayer where you can stand until you yourself, you are activated into another realm and your spiritual systems come alive. Where you can pick sounds and vibration in the spirit. He said that is when you can confront a fallen angel. And if you don't do it, you talk against them. What you have done is trespass. They will shoot you with that. That's why you see a lot of people are cut off. They come to preach because they want to impress people. They now begin to challenge principalities. He said they will throw darts at you. You don't understand spiritual technologies. When you fraternize with the devil... And you choose not to follow him again, he will cut you off. And there is nothing God will do about it. If you die, you go to heaven. The Bible says, precious in the eyes of God is the death of a saint. So the devil is not an option to choose. By the time you choose him, you have entered under his dominion. Coming back from there must be total surrender to Jesus. He will frustrate your life. Make a waste out of you. Until a point comes where you are no longer relevant. If you are not careful, your soul will be choked. I tell you things that I have experience of. I'm not just telling you things because I read them. The spirit realm is beyond books. It's beyond books. There are 66 chapters in the Bible. If you read 
195 chapters every day, you read the whole Bible in two weeks. The spirit realm is bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than books. God is bigger than books. The scriptures are only gateways through which you enter into experience. That scripture you think you know is bigger than it. You, you, you know it. What you are reading is a word. By the time it opens to you, you will travel and you will never see the end of it. It's bigger than books. It's a realm of life. And everybody is summoned into that realm. So that you can have participatory experience with the Holy Ghost. God is going somewhere with your life. But He wants you to give Him an excuse to fulfill it. Enough of escaping while the mission is still on. Enough of turning to your own senses. The Bible says it's not given to man that walk into order his death. You cannot. You don't know the beginning from the end. You don't know as you are now. You can't stand up and say this is where the, the world ends. You don't have such knowledge. How much more eternity? Can you see tomorrow morning? It's not fabricated in the natural. It is in the spirit. Do you know when the sun will rise? Do you know the day where there will be no sun anymore? When you die, by what technology will you be ferried through the portals of the great divide? Where will your soul go to? Right now that you are sitting, where is your soul in your body? Where is your spirit? By what means can you think and imagine your house? Does it not occur to you that you are bigger than everything you are seeing? How dare you calculate your life based on all that you know about yourself? You are bigger than this. You are interacting with spirits that you don't even know their names. They are trying to establish a government over you so that you can be separated from God forever. But one thing you must do is to refuse every spirit of having dominion over you by submitting to Jesus. He says, submit yourself to God. Then you can resist the devil. You are bigger than you think you are. Who told you your emotions originate from your mind? Who told you what you are thinking? You are the one thinking it. Do you know the beings that are whispering into your mind? Do you know the boundaries of your mind? Where does your mind end? If you have traveled to Lagos before, right now, sitting in this room, you can still see Lagos. So who told you the boundaries of your mind as big as, 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 can be contained in time? Your mind is bigger than time. The Bible said He has put eternity in our hearts. Our heart is as big as the world. Bigger than the world. That is why you can imagine angelic beings. That is why you can imagine a world that you have never traveled into. Because your mind is a boundless entity. Why do you reduce yourself to your feelings, to your appetites? There are spirits in this business. Some of you, the reason you think so much about immoral things is because your DNA is designed with a prophetic anointing. But demons want to corrupt it so that you can see through a defective vista. You are seeing a lady, you are imagining her nakedness when you should be looking into the chambers of her heart and telling her the counsel of God. The prophetic dimension of you is what gives your mind a robust imaginative capacity. It is not for feeling, it is not for sensation. It is to fulfill a mandate that is bigger than you. And every time you submit yourself to God, what happens is that your life becomes a corridor, a corridor through which another purpose is born in eternity. Through you, God can reach out to many more generations. He called only Abraham. Until today, you and I are the sons of Abraham. What if he disobeyed? Do you know how far your obedience can go with God? Who told you it ends with you? Who told you? Who told you? You re you ancient Zion's king. Cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. <laughs> you reign, you ancient Zion's king. Cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Do you know why we worship him? He's called Alpha Omega. He's at the end before the beginning began. He knew you would be here today before the world was created. He knew you would wear this shirt even this night before the world was created. He said the very hairs of your head, they are numbered. The one you bought last week, he knows the number of every hair, every strand that fell. He's Alpha, he's Omega. He's the all-wise God. He's the all-wise God. Everything depends on him for survival. 
purpose. It doesn't depend on anything. Before the world was created, He was. He said, He's the one who was, who is, and who is to come. When the world is wrapped away like a canopy, He will still be there. His name is eternal God, the all wise one. You cannot understand His frame because He's formless. How do you design the shape of the one that created all designs? He has no purpose, He has no destiny, yet He gives destinies to men. It is in Him that we began, and only in Him can we end. Every one of us is a statement of the different dimensions of His reality. Not just you and I, even the angels. Gabriel is a representation of God. Michael is a representation of God. And can I tell you something? There are more than 100 trillion angels. All of them came out of Him. The mountains came out of Him. The rocks came out of Him. The waters came out of Him. He is the I am that I am. Having no beginning, no end. Oh, me kaso tabarastas. You want to pray now and worship Him? You want to talk to Him from the depth of your heart? Shabara papa teke bos kabaras. Ilalabanda re kiro parazasas. Shaba presto frete biras. Raka papas kapas kapas. Shalaba papa koa. Sika bondo se parida. Salibana Marienda Paradinoske, Brafilo sobre na tabarista, Rahiba Rahababones. O beleza se beleza ditoa. Já beberis capabandos, presenta paradinos. He can write a new story. He can begin with you afresh tonight. He can begin afresh tonight. There is no end with him. His name is Alpha and Omega. Talk to Jesus Forget the sensation I can throw all of you on the floor But it will not change your life only spirits can transform men. Only spirits can transform men. No sensation has the capacity to transform your destiny. Only spirits. Only spirits. Savere Benetasso. Start a new walk in your life. You honestly want to rededicate yourself for service. I'm not saying you want to be born again. 
The Holy Ghost has been instructing your heart time and again. You have run away. Summons to the place of prayer, you have refused. Summons to the place of evangelism, you have refused. Some of you have been willing, but the energy to bring to pass have never been there. But tonight, you want to say, God, if you are there and you do business with men, do business with me. Come, let me pray with you. I'm more interested in serious business and people falling down. Can you ask for mercy? You have been rebellious, rebellious, rebellious. But tonight you want something tangible, tangible. You are falling down in many meetings. You are falling down. But your life is not changing. You have been in bondage to secret sins. You know there is a fire burning in you. But every time you commit that immorality, your soul descends. You can no longer ascend. You don't know why. Some of you, every December, you try from January. But when it is December, you must fall to immorality. A demon, a demon has been coronated over your life. It's a time of change. It's a day of transformation. A day of empowerment. We chant in the Holy Ghost. Ah, ah, ah. Hey, we chant. moment of time the fire of God will literally begin to rest on you and I mean fire fire the fire of God some of you it will burn your heart some of you it will burn your hands as a sign that God is bringing you a visitation you will see that you can no longer control the hand the fire of God the fire some of you your legs will begin to burn your legs will begin to burn Precious spirit of the living God, look upon your people. Just play only the keyboard, very low now. I want to pray. Let the fire descend. What some of you need is fire. You have too much oxy and decorum to preach the gospel. You are too gentle. You are too conscious of people. A man on fire does not know courtesy. There's no courtesy with the man of fire. Have you seen a man burning before? Sometimes he runs naked into the market. He's looking for water. There's no courtesy about fire. And so precious spirit of the living God. I ask that your fire. Will begin to descend upon your people. Burn in them. 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 Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Touch now. Let every debris that has been planted in them by demons be burnt off in the name of Jesus. Burn on their inside. Shaka babreste fede manaska. Let God do His work. Let God do His work. Shaba bababas. Raka bateke boboske. Merito bonda saparadigas. Rafa teke borobos andaradigas. Rapa paritas. Radiata Savila Mandre, Kiro Pondos, Rapa Pasotos, Parasiros, Parasiros, never again, never again, but the devil has sway over you. Never again. Shaki Baratabes, Presa Vendo, Presa Vendo, Rekebira Parazondo Sataya, Raki Basetebes, Raki Basades, Shobarata Kapapas. Let the fountains of the deep be stirred tonight. Beyond tradition, church cliche, let the fire of God burn within the chambers of your heart. Let dimensions that were locked down before now begin to find expression. Shaki Barazinos. Mama 
Ambre se penetra kadiska. Tarazino sendre kila paras. Morozindo sa prateges. Shalavina sombre na kazata. Rapapate kebondo soriska. Let God walk on your inside. Let Him walk. And even while you are kneeling down, some of you will begin to have visions and encounters about your destiny. Encounters. Even right now, let your spiritual senses begin to open. Precious Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to gather and to congregate under the auspices of your spirit. We are persuaded tonight that your hand will rest and descend upon us mightily to cause a quickening on our inside. We are persuaded by the reason of the supply of your grace there will be enlargement of capacities granted us even with the requisite wisdom required to extend the frontiers of the kingdom. We trust even tonight that the very reason for which your spirit have put together this meeting will not just gain momentum tonight but it will become clearer and the intensities of the energies of the spirit supplied to advance this purpose for which your spirit have designed even those dimensions will begin to find expression Thank you, gracious Father. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. In the precious name of Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. It's needful for us to realize that our world is besieged with darkness. The worst thing that can bedevil a Christian at a time like this is to think by any means that the operations and the occurrences of events around his life is a function of coincidence. Every activity that you see play around your life and around your environment is a function of strategic intelligence from the, from the spirit realm. Either orchestrated from the realm of God or from the demonic. What constitutes an advantage is your understanding of the principles, the precepts, and the mysteries that governs the operations and the interactions of spirits. And the greatest wisdom that you will have operational in your life in a season as strategic as this is the wisdom of alignment with spirits that are responsible for the orchestration of tides of events and sequences of circumstances. However, unfortunately, only Christians are relaxed in a season that is largely characterized by warfare. Only Christians think that the things happening around us is a function of coincidence. It is so unfortunate that the operations and the events marshaled out from the spirit realm could be swallowing up an entire family and they would not have risen to the defense of the integrity of that family and securing the heritage of God for that family thinking that everything happening is a function of coincidence until the very last man standing is swallowed up. A young man finds himself running after things that are outrightly against his destiny. But he just feels that it's, a, it's an appetite. It's a desire that he has. He just feels it's an influence from a pair group. Largely does he do not realize that everything that is happening around him is a function of an orchestration by principalities hanging in the very heights of the spirit realm. Tonight I want to open your eyes to certain mysteries in the kingdom that will constitute an advantage for you which will not just be a, a momentary deliverance, but will give you capacity to walk in the liberty that you have in Christ Jesus for the rest of your life. The best kind of deliverance you have in your life is not the type that, is, that comes upon you by reason of casting out the devil. 
The greatest kind of deliverance that will happen to you is the realization of the fact that you are in the midst of a warfare. And you receive energy from the Spirit of God to stand your ground in righteousness and push back the tides of darkness. Until you receive that requisite capacity of the Spirit, you are still a puppet in the hands of the devil. And nothing strengthens a man like understanding. God speaking to Job, he said, declare now if you have understanding. The only thing that gives you authority for declaration in the kingdom is the kind of understanding that you come into an account of interaction with the spirit that holds that knowledge. If you have not interacted sufficiently with an understanding of a kind of operation, you will be a slave to it for the rest of your life. Jesus sat with the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And he began to ask, who do men say I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the word is upon this revelation, upon this strategy that you have secured in the Spirit. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The only assurance that the church has is to consistently and constantly stay fine-tuned and connected to the source of revelation. Because prevailing dominion only comes as you receive insight from heaven. He said, upon this kind of revelation, upon this strategy that you have apprehended in the spirit, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Any man that understands the technology of connection with heaven is totally delivered on earth and can never come under the authority or the influence of any other being. But most of us, we function by philosophies and ideologies that are caught from other men and we have not even proven it in our lives. The most intelligent strategy of discipleship is to connect people to the spirit realm. Where they can secure the voice of God for themselves. If you have not come to a point where you can secure the voice of God for yourself, what you are doing is religion. And it has no life in it. It may sustain the form of godliness, but it will never have the power of the Holy Ghost. That was not the design. The design was for every one of us to know the pathways by which we can navigate into the throne room. And until we begin to apprehend realities from that realm, we don't have authority in the natural. Little wonder we come to church, many prophecies, many revelations, but little impact. Because only few know the path into the throne room. Christianity is reduced to a religion. And it's so unfortunate. Tonight, God is going to open your eyes to what you need to do in order to be a true victor in life. <laughs> Everything Jesus has done for us is legal and it's in the spirit. Until you can trap it down in your soul, it will not be an experience. And until it becomes an experience, it has no authority to impart on existential realities. The challenges that are bedeviling you, they are real. And quoting things that are in the spirit will not change it. You must know how to travel there to secure that which is in the spirit so that you can tender it as a proof in the natural. That is when your life will begin to have meaning. It is the responsibility dimension of the Christian faith. And a lot run away from it. And they think by running away from it, they are doing themselves good. That is why we remain the way we are. But discipleship in the days of the patriarch was not the kind, or it's not the kind that we have today. That's why at the age of 17, Timothy will be obtaining elders in Ephesus. He was a bishop at the age of 17 because it was not a function of age. Neither was he a function of duration in the church. It was the function of grace apprehended on account of interaction with the spirit of life. There's an error in the orientation of the faith that we practice today. Thank God for choice servants of God that have their roots in the spirit, raising a young generation like this and equipping them 
with the requisite knowledge to challenge darkness. Tonight is a night of revelation. As you catch it, you will enter into it. <laughs> did you not notice when you read your Bible that Jesus never did any miracle for his 12 disciples? They didn't need it. What they needed was what we create miracles. When Jesus was about living, he came and he prayed for them. And the Bible said, open he their understanding that they may understand the scriptures. The moment their understanding was open, they had authority to control and to regulate the activities in their realm. What you need is understanding. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory to the Lamb! Glory to the Father! You are seated on the truth! Hallelujah! Matthew 16 verse 16 And Simon Peter answered and said Thou art the Christ The son of the living God And Jesus answered and said unto him Blessed art thou Simon by Jonah For flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee But my father which is in heaven And I say unto thee Thou art Peter And upon this rock I will build my church And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Before I begin to unravel the technology of revelation tonight, I'd like to show you something that Jesus pointed out. Even though the church was not yet born, Jesus emphatically specified that the gate of hell was going to contend with the church. If you are a student of the spirit, you will understand that there are different revelations for different dispensations. And every revelation that is apportioned to a dispensation must be declared upon the commissioning of God. So sometimes through intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you are carried into the realm of the Spirit and God begins to reveal things to you. And then to your dismay, God tells you never to utter it. And then if you don't have understanding, you begin to wonder, why did you have to reveal this to me if there is no need altering it? If you alter a revelation that is not backed up by a kingdom legislation, what you have done is that you have opened yourself up in the spirit realm and you become vulnerable. Because in the heavens of God, there are ranking angels that are custodians over different mysteries of the kingdom and they are watchers over different dispensations of the operations of God. There are angels in heaven that are never mobilized except a dispensation is about to open up. And there are angels that are watchers over dispensations. 
So whenever God is about to open up a dispensation, such angels are commissioned to go forth. Those are the angels that back up utterances and decrees from heaven that brings about an unveiling of a new kind of revelation to the earth realm. The earth realm happened to be the realm of manifestation. So realities are concluded in the spirit realm and they just break upon the earth realm by reason of the commissioning of God. And when God utters these things through men, angels are given authority to back them up even as they come to proclaim this revelation. Whenever a man, for instance, steps out of the jurisdiction of the utterance that God has given to him, what he has done is that he becomes open again. So his defense system becomes limited because the angels don't align with men. They align with the authority of God. That was why when Joshua went to destroy Jericho and he saw the angel of the Lord stood in, Je in Joshua chapter 6 with his sword drawn out, he said, are you for us or against us? The angel said unto him, nay. I'm neither for you, neither am I against you. But according to the word of the Lord, I might come. He is standing with the word of the Lord. So long as Joshua aligns with the decree of heaven, the angel will walk with him. The moment he steps out, he is at the risk of being slain. And the angel will do nothing about it because they are not emotional beings. By their configuration, they are executioners. They guard the jealousy of God and they watch over the authority of God. John the Baptist was sent in the spirit and in the powers of Elias. And what was his manifesto was to bring about the revelation and, and to alter the dispensation of the coming of the Messiah. You see, but when, while John was doing that, nothing happened to him. But the day he stepped out of that assignment, that mandate that was given to him, his head was on the tree. And the angel that was given the authority to guard that which John was called to do, did nothing about it. That is how the systems operate. When Jesus declared that the church is going to stand upon the revelation, he made us understand that there is a contention against it. And that is because... The same way angels are giving mandates to guard over unveiling dispensation, the same way there are ranking demons in the spirit that are watching out for breaking news from heaven. The same way there are ranking demons in the spirit watching out for unveilings of dispensation. And they will always come to fight it. So Jesus told us ahead of time that as the church is going to be unveiled, there will be attack, there will be adversary from the demonic realm. When you have this kind of understanding, the first thing you do is that you draw back and you begin to see the necessity of having the voice of the Lord. And that is why in the scripture, nobody does anything except as the voice of the Lord comes to him. The prophets were people that were always walking in delicate corridors where their lives were at risk. The reason why you saw them did dangerous things boldly and it didn't even occur to kings to kill them was because they did not utter a word except as the word of the Lord came to them. So in your time and in your dispensation today, if you are walking in a technology where you don't have understanding on how to apprehend the word of the Lord, you have actually put your life on jeopardy. So when you come to church and everything is going on, you should look out for the word of the Lord. When you go about your natural activities, you should look out for the word of the Lord. Because what you are doing is not subject to frivolities where you do it how you want or when you want. Everything you are doing is a well-legislated mandate. And if you fail on the assignment, your life is on track. A lot of Christians have not been taught the delicate balances of the spirit, so they take a lot of things for granted. And that is why a lot are cut off. And they don't even know why. Do you know that for not discerning the body of Christ, a lot of people die? For just coming to church and then you talk against the man of God, a lot of people die. You call it coming to serve the Lord, but Paul said for this cause, many sleep, not discerning the body. This is not a demon fighting you, but this is you going against the legislation of the kingdom. It is too important for you to know how to secure the voice of the Lord and live for it. Because there are entities that are fighting against the advancement of the purposes of God. Meanwhile, it's a privilege for every one of us that have been called. 
Because until the gates of eternity are open, you will not know the meaning of life. Life has no meaning except as you are standing on a mandate. What gives you relevance in time is the kind of assignment that you are fulfilling. Else, everything on your nostril is just breath. And the day it goes, you will discover you never lived. I heard a story by Dr. Miles Moreau of Blessed Memory. He went to a tomb, taking a siesta, just relaxing. And then he was looking upon the names of the people on the grave. And suddenly the voice of God came to him. And the Lord told him, these people didn't live. And he said, ah, this is their date of death now. They lived on earth. And this is when they, they died. And he said, no, they only breathed the breath of life. They didn't live. Why? Because they didn't scratch the purpose for which they were created. And as far as the blueprint of heaven is concerned, if you have not scratched the purpose for which you were born, you are not factored in the purposes, in the economy, and in the workings of God in the world to come. And in case you do not know, everything we call time is not relevant, except as God has a purpose he wants to fulfill. And what will give you relevance in the world to come, where true life is, is the extent to which you fulfill the purpose for which God has brought you here. And the only way you can do that is to find out how to secure the voice of God. Because God has a word for every one of us. So accurate discipleship is pushing people into the spirit realm where they can secure God for themselves. But unfortunately, more than 90% of the people in the church have never heard God. If we take a census now and say, when was the last time God spoke to you? You'll be amazed. Some persons have never heard God. But they've been Christians since the day they were born. Some are even in leadership position. Because they think the Christian corridor is like a political corridor. Where through service, through commitment, or through conversing of support, you can ascend to the ladders. But it's far from it. It is actually a work of intimacy with the spirit. Understanding the heartbeat of that spirit and conforming to his desires until that which he has in mind is better through you in your world. Life is deeper than we see it. And if you don't know it, you will not know what you are looking for. You will only be looking out, living for your appetites and the things you desire. Most of them vanish away before the very seasons you are in. You know the last time, can you remember the shoe you wore four years ago? But some people live all their life for shoes. Do you remember the food you ate three weeks ago? But some people live their life for food. What a waste. What a waste. My spirit is burdened because I'm seeing a lot of young people here. It's time for you to begin to look for meaning. Daddy told me, he said, it's a season for activating kingdom realities. What are the realities in the kingdom? <laughs> when we speak about realities, we speak of things that are both real in the spirit and in the natural. They hold sway in the spirit and in the natural. They cannot be shaken or altered in the natural. And if you enter the spirit, they will still not be shaken. For example, if you are sick now and you are a Christian, no worry. And they say you have cancer. You don't have cancer. Now, in the natural, they can even go to the lab and discover there is a growth. And they call the growth cancer. But by the time you journey through the veil of the divide and you enter into the spirit realm and you see your reality, there is no cancer there. That is because in the spirit, you have already apprehended healing. But you don't know how to transmit healing from the spirit to the natural. So in the natural, they say you have cancer. That is fact, but it's not reality. That is what? Fact. But what we are dealing with for this season is reality. Realities are things that are real in the natural and in the spirit. They still sustain the same capacity. But the greatest reality in the spirit is the person of the Christ. He's the one that controls and regulates the totality of the government, both in the spirit and in the natural. When you start talking about realities, then you begin to look at entities. You begin to look at thrones. You begin to look at laws, precepts, policies that governs the oppression of the realm. For example, the reason why fact cannot be superior to reality is that reality can alter fact. Fact can never alter reality. The day I realize that I've been healed in Christ, in the natural, the hidden power will superimpose over the cancer and it will die. But there will never be a day where my spirit will have cancer. Because what is in my spirit is reality. But what is in the natural is only temporal. That's why Paul said, why we look at the things which are not seen. 
He said the things which are seen they are temporal, but the things that are unseen they are eternal. This weekend we want to focus at the things that are unseen because that's what your life is built upon. And the first thing I want to open to us tonight is about the person that governs the operation of the realm. Is the beauty of heaven. In fact, for us to understand him is the reason the Holy Ghost came. Without him, you cannot substantiate reality. In fact, in a bold statement he made, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The word truth there means the substance of reality. Everything that is a reality proceeds from my inside. Outside of me, nothing exists. I am the substance of reality. The question is, how many of you have met him? The day you meet Jesus, that day a lot of things will begin to break out. I'll share some test, mind-blowing testimonies with you today. And then you will realize that it's not about the stature of a man. It's about his encounters in the spirit. The cardinal reason the Holy Ghost came is so that you will know him. You will know him. Jesus said, I have many things to say to you. He said, but you can't receive it. He said, how be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all realities. The question is, what is Jesus talking about? What is the reality the Holy Ghost is guiding us into? He said, I am the substance of reality. So what he's telling us is that the Holy Ghost is going to carry you into the multifaceted dimensions of my being. There are different quarters in Jesus. There are different dimensions in Jesus. What you call gifts is a place in Christ. What you call power is a place in Christ. What you call prosperity is a place in Christ. Only if you will walk with the Holy Ghost, He will journey you through there. Jesus said that is the cardinal reason the Holy Ghost is coming. He will guide you into all realities. There are four major dimensions of the reality of the Christ that is revealed in the New Testament. I want to show you those four places quickly before we begin to pray. Where is the Holy Ghost guiding us to? Into all reality. What is, what is, what is, what represents all reality in the spirit? It's a person. His name is Jesus. If you have been working with the Holy Ghost accurately, you would have traveled into different places in Jesus. You would have traveled into different places. The reason a lot of people fascinate over angels is because they have not seen Jesus. He is the beauty of the spirit realm. Some people fascinate themselves over different operations. They have not seen Jesus. The day you see Jesus, you will be lost over him. Your soul will be eaten up. Your soul will be eaten up. You don't know what men see that make them stay in the place of prayer for days. And they don't come out. They are not using their will. It's not their will they are exercising. It's one thing for you to go and kneel down and say I must pray for 10 hours. It's another thing to go and kneel down and be sucked into the spirit realm. You will lose consciousness of time. You are touching something. You are touching a being. His name is Jesus. The moment you see him, you will become like him. You will be sucked into him. One less will be secure. Is the beauty of life. He said the reason the Holy Ghost have come is to carry you into my dimensions. And you need to understand that only the Holy Ghost has the capacity to do that. You see, there are three revelators in the spirit realm. The first revelator in the spirit realm is the Father. The second revelator in the spirit realm is the Son. And the third revelator in the spirit realm is the Spirit. This is how the Father reveals. What the Father does is that He gives you disclosures. He gives you what? Disclosures. So sometimes you just, you are going to church, you don't know what to do, and suddenly you just feel, this is what I should do. We call those disclosures. They are knowings. 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 The Father gives disclosures. But you see, disclosures are not sufficient. Because you can know about something, but you will not be there. 
How many of you before have had a knowing about something, but you didn't have the capacity to bring it to pass? You see, you were given a disclosure in heaven. So even the apostles, when they saw the church, they couldn't bring the church to pass. Because disclosures are not enough. Peter knew how the church was going to be built. The son gives instructive revelations. So when the son speaks to you, he tells you what you ought to do. It's not just a disclosure now. He tells you how you need to do it. But even at that, you don't have the capacity to do. The only one that gives you disclosure, instruction, and also gives you the capacity to do is called the spirit. That is why it is only the spirit that will guide you into all truths. Let me tell you something. You may, you may be told the symptoms of malaria. You know that you have sore throat, weakness, pains all over, and then sometimes you have headache. So you now know what malaria is. So you can identify malaria in people. You see, that's what a lot of us have. And that is why you see that we are fault finders in the church. Everybody knows, ah, this is not, this is how it should be, this is how it should be. But nobody is doing it because we only have disclosures. And then you could even come to a point where you can identify or diagnose who has malaria. But you still don't know malaria. The father will give you, this is what malaria looks like. The son will give you the description, detailed description of malaria. But if the Holy Ghost wants to show you malaria, he will put malaria on you. So you will have first-hand experience of malaria. So by the time you are knowing malaria, you are experiencing malaria. You have become malaria. That's how the Holy Ghost teaches. And that is why it is the responsibility of the Holy Ghost to guide you into all realities. So what Jesus is trying to say is that, I'm about to leave this world. But you see, only people who carry my DNA can conquer the world. And the only way carriers of my DNA can come into the world is to bring a teacher who will not only talk to them about me, but as he carries them, they will become me. So when you come into the congregation of the righteous, you are not seeing Peter, you are not seeing John. You are seeing Jesus Peter. You are seeing Jesus John. Because every one of us has the DNA, the nature, and the capacity of the Christ. So God is no longer perturbed in heaven because he knows that the same ability that Jesus operated in, ability we are going to have. So the worst undoing of a Christian is his refusal to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because every time we refuse to yield to the Holy Spirit, we are subscribing to the energy of the flesh. Instead of taking the energy of the Spirit. When you begin to yield to the Holy Spirit, you now discover you are not looking like the Spirit. You are looking more and more like Jesus. Because the duty of the Holy Spirit is to carry you into all realities. Let me show you the four dimensions of the realities of the Holy Spirit quickly before we go. The first revealed in the New Testament is Jesus, the Son of God. Until that revelation becomes real to you, you will never have confidence against the devil. If you don't know Jesus, the Son of God, you will never see yourself as the Son of God. I told you what does the Holy Ghost does? As He carries you into, you will become like Him. The Bible reveals. Let's read a few scriptures very quickly. We are already out of time. You see, the three term is so beautiful. You can tap into an economy and then you travel beyond many dispensations to see the things that are far away from your dispensation. Are we together? It's a possibility in the spirit. So the first man that entered into this understanding was Isaiah. And it was Isaiah that began to tell us. He said, unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. The first dimension of Jesus that is relieved and re re revealed and given to the church is Jesus, the Son of God. The question is, why is it important for us to know Jesus as the Son of God? Because it is in the context of this knowledge that you will now have confidence in the fact that you, a mere mortal, can also become the Son of God. And there is no way you can explain this in articulate speech. You only know it by experience. You see, the Holy Ghost is the most important personality in the world. The Holy Ghost is the most important entity in the world. 
the journey of the spirit actually begins as you begin to interact with the Holy Spirit. If you don't know the Holy Spirit, you can be accurate theologically because of many years of learning, but you will not have understanding of spiritual things. You cannot be a consultant of mysteries. You cannot give direction as, as it pertains to kingdom. Because this kind of knowledge does not come from studying. You see, the apostle said, he pleased the Holy Ghost and us that you should not burden this world that just came into the kingdom. You see, when Jesus left, there was no syllabus for the apostles to study. There was a serious contention in the Gentile church. Who will they consult? Who will they speak to? There was nobody. It was only as they latched the Holy Spirit. And they said, He pleased the Holy Ghost and us. As you begin to walk with the Holy Spirit, the first thing He shows you is Jesus, the Son of God. That is when the credentials of Jesus is beginning to open to you. You see, you may be bedridden for many years. And then, they show up and tell you, Jesus is your healer. But because of the years of suffering, your suffering has become so real to you that even if they told you this is Jesus, it will be difficult for you to accept that he can do anything about it. Except as you begin to hear his credentials over and over again. The woman with the issue of blood, she heard. She heard. And when she had heard to a point that she was saturated, you know, when she was hearing, she was still consulting with doctors. Because the doctors seemed to have results. But a point came where the doctors could no longer suffice. And then at this point, the Bible recorded that she heard. She had heard about the credentials of this man. She heard so much that she said she didn't need the man to talk to her. If she could only touch the helm of his garment. From whence did she apprehend that kind of faith? By her understanding of the person of the Son of God. The capacities that this man reveals, they are not ordinary. The things that this man does, they are supernatural. Who is this man? Who? 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 So one of the things the Holy Ghost labors to reveal to you is a revelation of the fact that Jesus did not come from this realm. He came from a realm that is superior to your realm. And you must have to know it and believe it. He said, God, who had sound three times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, had in this last day spoken unto us by his son. He is trying to give you a distinction between the prophet. You may have heard about Moses. He parted the Red Sea. You may have heard about Elijah. He caught fire from heaven. He said, but this one is not a prophet. He is the son of God. He said, by whom all things were made. By whom all things were made. This one I'm speaking about. He created all things. He didn't have the power to, to manipulate the causes of creation. It, it, it's not like Joshua that had to tell the moon to stop. He created the moon. That is the revelation of the Son of God. He begins to create a consciousness in your mind that he is beyond your scope of existence. And in case it has not sunk into you very well, he said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He said, the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That's the credential. The Holy Ghost will begin to reveal these dimensions to you. Until a point will come where nothing will be as real to you as the powers of Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us. He said, my son, attend to my words. He said, give thy ears to my saying. Let them not depart out of thy eyes. He said, put them in the midst of thy heart. He said, they are life to them that find them. One thing the Holy Ghost does for you is to bring you to a point where you find the son of God. Until you come there, you will never have confidence. You can be a pastor and you come to the pulpit and you are shouting, Abba, Abba! or you have a, you are a cell leader, or you are leading a, some young people and you are talking with, with boldness, with audacity. But they, when they bring a real life challenge, the first thing that will attack your heart is fear. That fear is not shouting, but it's more real to you than your voice. The only way you can deal with that is until the revelation of the all powerful son of God is granted you. So when you begin to journey with the Holy Spirit, that's the first place it takes you to. It takes you to a place where you have total confidence in God. And that is when you can surrender to Him. 
If you don't have confidence in God, you can never surrender. Because man is designed such that his brain reads negatively. And the reason he reads negatively is to create an advantage of security for him. As we are here now, the moment you hear a sound, you will respond before you think. That's how you are designed. It's designed like, you are designed like that to keep you safe. So you cannot trust what you don't, you, you cannot rely on what you don't trust. So the Holy Ghost will first of all carry you into a realm of God where you can trust Him. And most people have not even as much as come there. And it doesn't matter how bogus we talk about it. We have not come there. Don't allow your heart deceive you. You can be a leader. You can even be running a fellowship. And you are saying bogus things that you don't believe. Don't allow your heart deceive you. Better go and settle down first. Kenny Hagin said he read the New Testament 150 times before he began to speak. He was called, he settled this matter in his heart. He settled it. Is it settled in your heart? If it's not settled in your heart, you will trust in other things. And it's so unfortunate that even though you are not saying it, in the spirit realm it is real. Because your thought is tangible there. Here your thought is intangible. But in the spirit realm, your thought is tangible. The angels are seeing it and even demons are seeing it. So when you start now, you are proclaiming with authority. The demons will just be laughing. Because you can deceive the people. But in the spirit realm, fear is standing on your head like, like a sword. It is visible. We have come to a church where everybody is talking big. Talking big, all kinds of lofty things. But we believe so little. That's why our results are very little. You must follow the Holy Spirit. That's the first revelation in the Bible about Jesus. The Son of God. The angel appeared to Mary. And he said, That thing that is formed in you, it shall be called the Son of the Highest. This must be formed in you. Because that will become the basis of your conviction. A lot don't have conviction. And that's why we trust in uncles, we trust in money, we trust in people, we trust in things. There are some who have graduated for six years. They have received disappointment continually, but they have never been able to shift their trust. Because they don't have any other object of trust. It's a pity. But that's how we live. And the reason is because we have not apprehended the Son of God. He said, Thus hear the Lord. He said, Woe unto the man that trusted in man, who maketh flesh his arm. He said, Whose heart departed from the Lord. The day you make any other thing your trust, what happens to you that you are not aware of is that your heart has already departed from the Lord. He said, It shall be like the heat in the desert. He shall not see good when he cometh. He shall live in the parched places of the desert, a salt land that is not inhabited. Most of us, we are not even aware that our heart has departed from the Lord. We keep trusting things, trusting things. The first thing you need to do today in order to begin to orchestrate an activation of the mysteries of the kingdom is for you to come back to the Holy Spirit and ask Him to reveal to you the Son of God. You can quote Him. It doesn't mean you know Him. But they that do know their God. <laughs> they that do know their God. They shall be strong. And they shall do exploits. That's the first thing the Holy Ghost does for you. And the second thing the Holy Ghost does. Is that he reveals to you. Jesus. The Savior. Jesus, the Savior. When you know Jesus, the Son of God, and you develop strong conviction and confidence, then the Holy Ghost reveals to you Jesus, the Savior. It's so amazing how sequentially these things are placed in the Bible. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Look at what the Bible says. Uh, 
Hallelujah. Are we together? He said, but why he thought on these things? That's Joseph. Contemplating on what to do regarding his wife. Ex Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, after the son, what next? And thou shalt call his name Jesus. The second revelation, the second reality that the Holy Ghost carries you to, is the reality of Jesus the Savior. Most of us are still not sure of our salvation. And so we are weak. We are weak in our contentions. We are disadvantaged in our operations because we have not come to a full assurance of our salvation. The totality of salvation is within the scope of the name of Jesus. I wish I had time to talk about salvation tonight. It is in Jesus that you find the incarnation. It is in Jesus that you find the birth. It is in Jesus that you find the suffering and the death. It is in Jesus that you find the resurrection. It is in Jesus that you find the ascension. And all of these five things have five different implications. There was no way the falling man could satisfy the claims of divine justice. There was no way atonement could be made for man. Because nothing on earth was devoid of corruption. Only a reality that came from the realm of God himself had the capacity to sustain a, 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 a disposition that is void of corruption. And that substance that came from the realm of God is a person called Jesus. On account of his purity, by reason of where he came from, he has the capacity to pay to be rendered as a ransom. So the incarnation itself is a revelation of the quality of sacrifice that God provided for atonement. It is in the death that the old man is dealt with. And there are two things that happen in the death. One pertains to the blood, the other pertains to the cross. The blood deals with the sins you commit. The cross deals with the sin nature. Apostle will always tell us. He said you could go around the town and collect all the beer bottles. Maybe more lager beer and destroy all of them. But if you have not done anything about the factory, you have wasted your time. So when the blood was spilled, he took care of the committed sin. But the cross, he deals with the nature of sin. The serpentine nature. That we succeeded from Satan. And carrying the cross is a lifelong reality. The Holy Ghost will teach you and he will place the cross upon you every day. It is one of the greatest burden. You see there are five things you die to as a human being. You will die to sin. You will die to Satan. You will die to judgment. You will die to the world. But the 15, which is the hardest to die to, is flesh. To die to flesh, God does not do it absent of your own consciousness. You will do it with your eyes open. That's what the Bible means when they say, we are living sacrifices. That's where you die to self. You cast yourself, you cast your appetite, cast your ambition away at the instance of the voice of God. And that is where you really become like God. The only way to put out the old man is to pick your cross. And picking your cross is dying to self. And if you don't die to self, you can never do business with God. You see, God is father. So as father, there are lots of things that you can do. You know, you fall today, come tomorrow, say, Lord, I'm sorry. Because he's father. And he will keep you as son. But if you want to come to kingdom legislation... You will not meet a father. You will meet a judge. And in meeting with a judge, you will interact not by love, 
you interact by laws. When you are interacting with father, it's on the basis of love. But when you are interacting with the judge of all, you are interacting based on law and righteousness. Because in kingdom legislation, warfare is involved. There are entities that will cut you off. And because they are subscribing to the laws of the spirit, there is nothing God can do about it. There are demons that will cut you off because you step out of the provision of the laws of righteousness and there is nothing God can do about it. Paul began to talk about warfare. He said, why you have done all this to stand? He says, stand there up. Because there is a possibility that you will not stand when you are done. This is kingdom legislation. So he said, you should be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word power, there is the word kratos. Might is the word iskus. Kratos is not the same power you receive when you receive the Holy Ghost. And yes, shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's dynamis. That one is a potential power. Kratos is dynamic power. This light you are seeing is kratos. Light came because the gem, the dynamo in the gem has taken off. What you have with the Holy Spirit is the dynamo. But you have to activate the dynamo until it becomes like this. Before you can even begin to talk matters of warfare. So a Christian who does not engage in tongues until power is activated in his inside is not even a candidate of warfare. That's Kratos. And then this is his military might, participation with other forces in the spirit in order to advance the kingdom of God. That one has to do with your understanding of the operation of the angelic. Because that is the other army that we war with. You know, God we told we tell David that when you see the wind move against the mamri tree, I have gone ahead. So the reason he won many battles was not because he was so strong. It was not because of his military intelligence. It was because of partnership. That kind of power is called Iskus. That was the kind of power Daniel engaged after he prayed for 21 days. And the angel Gabriel said, I have been caused to fly swiftly so that I may give you skill and understanding. And when Gabriel was not sufficient, Michael was sent again to contend with who? The prince of Persia. That is not a demon. That is a fallen angel. You cast out demons. You don't cast out fallen angels. You war with them. You don't know why a lot of us are shouting things but people are dying. Not every category of the demonic is a demon. Some are fallen angels. They can appear in the presence of God. So that you are worshipping does not mean they will go away. Jesus finished fasting for 40 days and Satan came and said, come. <laughs> fallen angels. You know, Paul was the one that told us cast it down imagination and every high standing thing that opposes itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity all things to the obedience of Christ. When your obedience is fulfilled, you fulfill, you avenge other disobedience. That was when he was young in the faith. If you go and check the chronology of the writings of Paul, he began with First Thessalonians, he ended with Colossians, Ephesians, First Timothy, and Second Timothy. Go and see the things he wrote there, they are mysteries. It was in the book of Ephesians where utterance was granted him that he began to talk about warfare. That time he didn't say cast down. He said, first of all, you must be kitted with the whole armor of God. If you don't have the armor of God, you will die. And you don't walk with a fallen angel by shouting the name of Jesus. You walk with them by Rema. By Rema. If you don't understand the technology of Rema, you can't walk because it's the sword of the spirit. If you have not known how to catch Rema in the place of prayer, you can't war with them. And Paul said they will throw fiery darts at you. Some of those darts are cancers. Some of those darts are hepatitis. Some of those darts, they are different things that will malign your destiny. So there are a lot of things required. But only a Christian who have died can travel the extra miles. Because only a dead Christian can legislate the kingdom. The kingdom is not for living men, it's for dead men. The only life that springs out of them is the life of the Christ. The one that sits in the office of the Christos. It's not for dead men. Have you not noticed the operation of the sanctuary? When you enter through the gates, the gate is the full revelation of Jesus as the king, the son, the servant, and the, 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 the life of God. When you enter through the gate with thanksgiving, then you come to the altar of sacrifice. You place yourself there. When you have dropped yourself, before you start legislation, 
Everybody can be in the outer court. Only the priest enter the inner court. Because before you enter the inner court, you must come into relationship with the Holy Ghost. In the lava where you wash your hand, that is the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. If you have not entered into intercourse with the Holy Spirit, forget about kingdom legislation. You are a babe. You are not relevant for the equation of God. In the world to come, your name will not be mentioned. That word is for overcomers. Everybody will be there, but not everybody will be a captain. Not everybody will be relevant. You journey there by salvation, but you are relevant there by service. You wash and you enter. When you enter, you begin to navigate. Do kingdom matters. You receive strength from the table of showbread. You receive illumination from the menorah. That time there is no sunlight anymore. In the outer court, everybody can use the sunlight. But in the inner court, if you have not received light from the world, you can't go forward because only the lampstand shines there. And if you have journeyed to the point of the high priest, after the altar of incense, then you enter the Holy of Holies. Where true kingdom business is done. There, there is no light. It's the Shekinah that illuminates you. You must have traveled into the spirit until you can see for yourself. A lot of Christians are not raised. We have never journeyed anywhere. We live for our appetites. Bogus appetites. Young people. Full of pride. A generation of proud men. We come and then we talk down on the fathers. How can he say this? This thing he said is wrong. You have revelation that have not been proven. Your revelation have not discipled ten people. And you are, you, are, you are correcting a bishop that have stood for 30 years. Do you know what it means to stand with God for 10 years? You know what it means to stand for 20 years? You have not even done your Christian faith for two decades. You are correcting a bishop in arrogance and folly. That is why we die in our generation. We are cut off because of our foolishness. We know nothing. We don't even labor to enter into the rest. But we are willing to talk. It is in the death that all your appetites and your ambition are sacrificed. The Holy Ghost will take you there. In the resurrection, you enter into the newness of immortality. It is in the resurrection that you have confidence to survive in the world to come. Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. He was not quoting from the Old Testament. That is what he caught when he was traveling with the Holy Spirit. He realized that the gate through the portals of the divine was the gate of revelation. Anybody that has crossed into the resurrection of Christ, he has hope. And if there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. Paul was the one that told us that. He didn't read it from anywhere. He caught it in the spiritual. He discovered that the crucible of the Christian faith is resting upon the resurrection. If you have not caught the revelation of the resurrection, there is no hope of immortality for you. And that is why when you gave your life to Christ, what you confessed was the risen Christ. Because in the resurrection, you cross from the gateway of death into the regions of life. Immortality is factored into the revelation. When you see Christians that are not sure of tomorrow, it's because they have not known the resurrection. The Holy Ghost will carry you through those realities. Carry you through all those realities until you come to a point where you have apprehended the soul. All of that is in Jesus. It is in the ascension. Oh my God. It is in the ascension that authority is conferred. Have you seen Christians that lack authority? So much. They have fasted for 30 days before coming for the meeting, but they are still not sure. The problem is not the activity. They don't understand who they are in the ascended Christ. The ascension is another, is another dimension of reality that the Holy Ghost will take you to. All of that is factored into the economy of the administration of God. That is what the office of the Christ is currently doing. The office. The office of the Christ is responsible for the totality of the administration of heaven. It is by that office that you are given a ministry. Have you not wondered why some people are in church for 15 years but they are not responsible? They are not in leadership. They just feel Christianity is come, take from God and go away. But the Bible says when Moses was come of age, when he was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt that was for a season. He came of age. When you come to a point where the resurrection becomes real to you, then you begin to look for responsibility in the kingdom. That is why Jesus never gave any ministry office except as he was ascended. He said, him that ascended, what descended was the same that ascended on high 
and he said as he ascended he gave gifts unto men to some he gave to be apostles some he gave to be prophets some he gave to be evangelists some he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the sin that question is a long eight question of redemption in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1 and 8 the Bible says who has believed our report unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed and in verse 8 it says who shall declare his generation the man that will declare his generation is the man that have caught the revelation of the risen Christ he now knows that he's not in God only for what he can get God also has need and is looking out for it to meet it so he discovers himself worshiping God and crying worshiping God every day like a personal assignment why he has come to a point where he know that the father is seeking true worshipers he has come to a point where he has realized that his life his life should be an extension for the pleasure of god when john was carried to heaven he saw the 20 and four elders fall to the ground worshiping fall to the ground watch the man was left in total oblivion is this not heaven where people come to rest the bible said the four beasts they worship in day and night forever and ever and then the 20 and 4 elders that were already seated on throne, they will cast their crown and fall on the ground flat. What is happening here? I thought heaven is a place of fun and pleasure. We suffered on earth so that when we die, we'll come to heaven and rest. No, you don't rest in heaven. Heaven is a place of ministry. That's what he caught the elders doing. They were worshipping him. Worshipping him that is called holy. Holy, holy, holy separate you are different you are in your own class you see the angels don't have a word for god they, they can't even give him a name they only call him you are separate in your own class you are in your own class because every day they see him the illumination becomes brighter they see many dimensions they can't understand which being is this they say holy holy you don't know the privilege that you have as a man and you don't know the opportunity that you have in time when you get to heaven that is when most of us will realize what we have wasted in time are you aware that the angels don't know god by experience they are like what they have is what was configured into them the only way god can be known is by his spirit only man has the spirit of god that is why the bible said in ephesians 3 10 that the principalities shall watch as the church we teach them the exceeding mysteries of god it was man that said god is love it was man that said god is light it was man that said god is powerful the only thing the angels call god is holy the word holy is not a name it means being your own class separated unto your own name there is none like you they don't know you. they look upon your life to learn about god but you are here wasting away because you refuse to follow the holy ghost how do you expect to become relevant we were coming and my friend told me in the car he said imagine the population in kaduna alone he said serving god was not about heaven he said how do we even expect to survive with this kind of competition even if serving god was only for this life how can one survive with this kind of competition the only advantage we have is the spirit we fraternize with fraternity with spirit is what constitutes an advantage in time that's why you see somebody selling pure water and say millionaire it's not about the pure water it's a spirit it's a spirit and spirit life is not given to verbosious and very large exegetical explanation it is making a choice to follow if it is so hard god will not expect every man to do it so it's not a function of very difficult and intrinsic languages it is weaved into every man every one of us hear him jesus said my sheep heareth my voice everyone the question is the question of obedience will you follow the holy spirit the people that know the risen christ they don't know him because they are special they knew him because they started traveling with the holy spirit there was a point in their life when all they knew was the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. Then they would come and say, do you know the Son of God? They kept following the Holy Ghost. A day came, suddenly, it dawned on them that Jesus was their healer. A day came, it dawned on them that Jesus was their life. 
a day came, he dawned on them that Jesus was the reason they were living. They carried their Bible and began to preach. If Jesus is the reason I'm living, I will do his will. So it is a journey with the Holy Spirit. It's not a function of study. It's not a function of, 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 of so much learning or traveling. From where you are in your niche, if you will subscribe to the Holy Spirit, a strange dimension can break out upon your life. I've read stories about great men of God. Great women of God. People like Catherine Kuma. A woman that could not as much as find a man to love her genuinely. That was the level of rejection she suffered. But there was the Holy Ghost waiting for her to make her a specter in her generation. The day she subscribed, if you listen to her, you will be sleeping. She, could, she did not as much as have a very effective way of communication. But all she had was the Spirit. And by the Spirit, she shook her world. It's the question of obedience. From where you are, are you willing to subscribe? Because there is a long journey the Holy Ghost will take you. And it's not a function of time, it's a function of realities. The encounters that you have is what will make you become that which you only imagine. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus is the Lord. That's the last revelation that launches you into the realm of power. Jesus the Lord. How many know Jesus the Lord? You see, the Bible says Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. What it means is not just that Jesus is the one that bets faith on your inside. No. What it also means is that Jesus is the example of faith that you will follow from the beginning to the end. The only way he entered into power was by absolute obedience. Absolute obedience. When he began, he came to John the Baptist. John had hyped him. The one that cometh, even the latchet of his son, I'm not worthy to untie. <laughs> and then here comes Jesus and knelt down to be baptized. And John said, No, 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 no. I should be baptized of you. He says, Suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh of us to fulfill all righteousness. He finished, and the Bible said he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost to be tempted of the devil. He followed. And when that sequence of trials was completed, he returned in the power of the Spirit. And the power he returned with was a power to serve in humble obedience. You will think that now that he has power, he can do what he wishes. But he was still a slave of the Holy Spirit. So the Bible said, because of this kind of obedience, he said God has given him a name that is above every other name. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. It's not because he did something in warfare. He didn't fight the spirit. He didn't fight humanity. He only obeyed the Holy Ghost. He obeyed to a point where he said, at the mention of that name, every knee will bow. Why you have authority is not because of your proclamation. It's not because of the warfare you stand on the street. Or the rage you rage when you carry the microphone. Is the extent of obedience and submission you give yourself to in the privacy and the quarters where you rest your head in your private chambers. A lot of rebelliousness. But when we come to church, we are all an example to be followed. Apostle told us, he said the hallmark of the Christian faith is secret purity, strict righteousness, and generous kindness to others. Because of his obedience, he said, God has given him a name that is above every other name. At the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee bows. Every tongue confesses that Jesus is the Lord. The name is not Jesus. The name is the Lord. Because Jesus was given when he was born. The name is what? That Jesus is the Lord. The Lord is Jehovah. The Almighty. And because he's the author and the finisher of your faith, that part he has crafted is what you and I will follow. A point came where we sprang out, all of us praying for power. Power, power, power. God, give us power. 
We must have power. But when understanding began to come to us, when understanding began to come to us, that was when we realized that power is not what you pray for. You become it through obedience. You become it through obedience. And most of us came into our rest. So the extent of obedience that you give in is the extent of power that you receive. Will you yield to the Holy Spirit? Some of us here, the, the Lord have been perturbing us for many days, many months. Many months. Some is, you wake up and then you feel a leading to fast. But you don't. Meanwhile, whenever they give a fasting week in church, you want to show that you are the only one that completes the fast. What you are doing is that you are fertilizing your appetite. You are strengthening the flesh. The secret instruction that comes to you from the Holy Spirit is what will change your life. You go out there, you want to engage in the quarrel. He says, hmm. But you go ahead. That's why you will remain where you are for a long time. For a very long time. Power is not what you necessarily pray for. Power is a thing you become through obedience. As you follow the Holy Spirit, He will carry you through these four different chambers of God. He will introduce you to Jesus the Son where your conviction is strengthened and you have confidence in God beyond everything. He will introduce you to Jesus the Savior where you have an assurance beyond anything that happens to you or comes your way. He will introduce you to the Christ where you have the needed assurance and capacity to serve Him in an acceptable fashion. And then He will introduce you to Jesus the Lord where you have authority over the contrary forces that fights against advancing the purposes of God. This you don't come into by doctrine. You don't know it by doctrine. You know it by experience. And you only come into this reality as you follow the Holy Spirit. As you follow the Holy Spirit, He will guide you there. He say, how be it when the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide us into all realities. Can we bow our heads as we begin to pray? Today is just to set the coordinates. So that we we'll prepare our hearts. That the goal is not performance. The goal is becoming. The first layer of power that came upon you was power to become. He said, as many as received it, to them he gave power. To become the sons of God. And you cannot become except as you begin to see and interface with the person of Jesus. The multifaceted dimension of his reality. You must begin to see him. You must begin to see him. You must begin to see him. He said, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. It does not yet matter what we shall be like. He said, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him. That's an apostle that have operated in the highest realm of power. But he knew that what was important to God was becoming. You can be a Christian for one month and you will begin to see him and become like him. You can be a Christian for 10 years and you may never have seen him. You may never have been like him. And in the privacy of your heart, you know that you are far. Christianity is not an act. It's not an activity. It is the operation of divinity in a, hum in a human vessel. The extent to which God can find expression through you is the measure of your maturity in the faith. The extent of which you have become like Him is who you truly are in the Spirit. I'm delighted tonight because there are many young people here. You have heard a lot of things, heard a lot of revelation, heard a lot of rema. But what have you become? Those private things you do in your private chambers, will you be bold to do them in the public? Those are the things that count with God. It's not the things you say to the public. It's not the things you do to the public. Before God, that's the question of all ages. If you come, be upstanding as we pray the Holy Ghost.
The transforming power of God is about to hit the building. The transforming power is about to hit the building. Rahiba Bundu Saparadas Rakapa Tiki Sakapa Shakapa Rapa the power. to do what I have to do next. Can we have it quiet for a moment? I want to give some persons an opportunity. You see, you may have been so involved in so many activities. You may even be a leader. But you know that in the privacy of your heart, you are far. You are far. Because you don't really know this Jesus. Maybe you know the Son of God, but you don't know the Savior. Maybe you know the Savior, but you don't know the Christ. And because you don't know the Christ, you have been rebellious in the place of service. I want to give an opportunity to few persons who want to make it right with God. You want to receive that empowerment for service tonight. You want the Holy Spirit to lead you into that place of experience. The experience of God. You see, you can be in the Spirit. John was in the Spirit in the Isle of Patmos. But he heard a voice. He said, come up here. There are deeper places in God. You want to journey to those places. I want to give you an opportunity. To step out tonight. And I will pray with you. You see, the greatest things don't happen where people are shaking and falling most of the time. 
I know the cause to touch, to throw everybody under the power. I know the call to touch, to get everybody so fascinated that they don't even hear what I'm saying. But they will be so fascinated. But we want something tangible to begin to happen in the lives of people. We are a young generation. We must know God by experience. The fathers knew him experientially. That was why they had impact. They are not quoting scriptures the way we are quoting. They are not talking in arrogance the way we are talking. For them to conquer nations, to shatter the foundations of kingdom, was because they knew their God. A lot of us don't know Jesus. A lot don't know Jesus. And it doesn't matter what you are doing in church. It doesn't matter where you are in church, where you are seated in church. It doesn't matter who knows you. The question is, are you on the registers of heaven? I want you to make a commitment to Jesus. Talk to him now. I will serve you with all my heart. I will serve you with all my might. As you make that commitment, very soon the power of God will begin to rest upon people. <laughs> Just make that commitment. I don't want it to be an emotional thing. I don't want it to be an emotional thing. You know, we know this song. Sometimes when we sing songs that are that touches our emotion. We, we respond by emotion. We don't know. We think it's the spirit. Make a conscious commitment to Jesus. Make a commitment. Make a commitment. Some of you will find yourself, you will begin to weep. Not because anybody tried to do anything emotional. The compassion of Jesus will begin to overwhelm you. Overwhelm you. Overwhelm you. Overwhelm you. A deep commitment. It's a deep commitment. I don't want to worship my mama. It's a deep commitment. Very deep. I Make a commitment to Jesus tonight. This is the most important part of the meeting. You, you stop praying now. Now you stop praying. Stop praying. Stop praying now. I want to pray for you now. The hand of God will come upon you. Some of you it will break hardness in your heart. Some of you it will trigger conviction. Some of you the compassion of the Holy Ghost will overwhelm you. Some of you will even begin to receive Activation of spiritual gifts now. Precious Holy Spirit. You know, we've not come to do an emotional thing or a religious activity. Look upon the hearts of your children that have come to make a commitment to you. Touch them now. Touch them now. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Touch! Holy Ghost. Breathe upon them. Let every yoke be broken now. 
Let the yokes be broken. Let the yokes be broken. Let the yokes be broken. Begin to quicken them with the fire of your spirit. Begin to quicken them. 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 The hand of God is coming now. See, we are used to we are used to hard large volumes and the rest. Just know the Holy Ghost is brooding upon your heart. This one is called transforming power. Transforming power, brooding through your hearts, breaking yokes, breaking yokes. Is doing a, a lasting, a long lasting transformational work within you. Just stay focused on the Holy Spirit. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me. Just stay focused on Jesus. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. I want to love you in love. Take me deeper. Take me deeper. Deeper in love. Can you stretch out your hands and pray for them? Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Let God strengthen them with might by His Spirit in the inner man. This decision you have made is a commitment. Spirits, spirits, respond very greatly to commitment. Spirits. It's not a word you have uttered. That's why I tried as much as possible not to make it emotional. So that you will know that it's a tangible commitment you have made. Stick to it. Stay by it. Give your life for it. Never. Never, never relent on this commitment you have made. Please walk out this way. There's somebody who is going to talk to you. What you need to do? Is there a counselor or something? Direct you out. Or better still, you can write your name, submit with your phone numbers. They'll get back to you later. You need to be instructed on what to do. Are we together now? You need to be instructed. So, as you go back, just drop your name and your phone numbers. You'll be communicated on what you need to do. But don't go back a lukewarm Christian again. Never. Never. It's time to make a decision. God bless you. You can go back. In the next one minute, lift up your hands now and begin to make demands. Begin to make demands now. We are done with transformational matters. It's time to deal with tangible things. You came with needs. You came with burdens. This is the time. This is the time. This is the time. This is the time. Ah, uh, ah, uh, let.
I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video, and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.